Welcome everyone to this Federalist Society virtual event as this afternoon, January 11, 2022. We're having a talks with authors uh, about a new book about the great, late, the late great uh, Justice John Marshall Harlan. Now the book is called The Great Dissenter, The Story of John Marshall Harlan, America's Judicial Hero. I'm Nick Marr, Assistant Director of Practice Groups here at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that expressions of opinion on our call today are those of our experts. We have a great panel today, including the book's author to discuss this book, The Legacy of This uh, Great Justice. I'm just going to introduce our moderator and then he'll take it from there. But we're very pleased to be joined this afternoon uh, by Judge Victor Wolski. Uh, judge Wolski is a senior judge at the US Court of Federal Claims. Uh, he also has, uh, he's really good at tying bow ties. Uh, so with that, Judge Wolski, the floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. Uh, it's really a great pleasure for me today to be uh, here at this talk with uh, a good friend of mine, Peter Canellis, uh, who I've known for, he's pointed out, over 40 years. Uh, we were classmates together at the University of Pennsylvania, where he was a writer for the school newspaper, and I was involved in student government. And uh, despite our conflicts of interest, we, we got along uh, pretty well, and we've, we've stayed good friends over the years. So it, I'm, I'm particularly pleased uh, to be here for this uh, event uh, on Peter's new book, the Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero. Now, as I said, Peter is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and also Columbia Law School. Uh, but despite going to law school, he chose to make his mark in journalism rather than the law and was uh, formerly the Washington bureau chief and then the editorial page editor for the Boston Globe, where he oversaw two Pulitzer Prize winning projects and somehow along the way ended up being a character in the Oscar award-winning movie, Spotlight. <laughs> Peter is currently the managing editor for Enterprise at Politico Magazine. Uh, also joining us for today's talk is a person who no, needs no introduction for the Federalist Society, but I'll introduce him anyway. Uh, our our uh, regular uh, guest here, Josh Blackman. As you know, Josh is a professor at South Texas College of Law, Houston. He graduated from Penn State University and George Mason University School of Law, clerked for Judge Danny Boggs on the Sixth Circuit, and is the author, among other things, of Unraveled and also of Unprecedented, which are two books about the Affordable Care Act. I guess we got to come up with another un untitled for a third one. Uh, third one will be un undefeated. Undefeated <laughs> or unfunded, perhaps. Uh, he's also the, uh, the co-founder and president of a nonprofit that's named after Justice Harlan. And I understand that the reason it was named after Justice Harlan is because he was one of the few justices that everyone from whatever end of the spectrum, politically or legally uh, a person was, was admired by uh, universally. Is that correct? Among other reasons, absolutely. Very good. And that's called uh, the Harlan Institute, which provides constitutional education and civics education and programming for high school students. So uh, thank you, Josh. Now, as I said, uh, Peter's book is, was a delight to read. It's, it's great to see somebody who has both a legal education, but also a journalist's eye and a journalist's uh, ability to, to craft the narrative and to, to make, make uh, the history come alive on the pages. And it, he's really done a great job. I think he's found his calling as a biographer. Uh, and it, as I said, the book's been well received. Don't just take it from me. Republican Senate leader Mitch McConnell, who's biased because he's also from Kentucky, as, as is uh, Justice Harlan, said that the great dissenter was, quote, a marvelous read, extremely well written. I highly recommend it. Now, uh, no less a luminary than George Will in one of his columns called the book Splendid and Stirring, and he found it particularly timely as legal and policy debates shift from the concept of equal opportunity towards notions of equity. Uh, virtually every law student remembers that day in their probably their second semester of law school when they, they're in con law class when you, when you learn uh, Plessy versus Ferguson, and you read the dissent by, by John Marshall Harlan, and the, the, and the dissent just usually rings out to, to a law student, and, and you think, what was wrong with the rest of these guys? This guy got it. The other ones didn't. Uh, Harlan was known in his time, not just for that dissent, but for taking a principled position on a lot of, a lot of major issues, particularly known as, as the one justice who was consistently vigilant and stood up for the rights of Black men and women in America. Uh, his, his uh, dissent in, in Plessy, as you know, has the proclamation, our constitution is colorblind. Uh, and when, when you read that in law school, you 
you just can't help but say, where was the rest of these guys? Now, Peter, why 40 years or 30 some years later after law school, why did you turn to Harlan and why, why this book? What was it? Was it remembering that descent or, or, or is there something else about Harlan? <laughs> No, no, definitely uh, remembering that descent, but also remembering other descents that I read in law school and just being struck uh, even so many years ago that, uh, uh, you know, here was somebody who a um, 100 years after these decisions came through, you know, clearly saw the law in uh, a very different way than his contemporaries and, and was proven right over time. You know, none of us uh, will have the luxury of knowing how we will be viewed 100 years from now, if we are lucky enough to be viewed at all 100 years from now. Uh, and uh, Harlan was somebody who, who stood the test of time. Uh, I also think that he's a deceptively important figure in a number of different ways beyond the Plessy descent. Um, I think that his whole range of dissents in, in the race cases, but also in economic cases, helped to set the stage for many of the changes that occurred in, uh, in the 20th century and in 20th century law and inspired some of the people who fought for them. So his story also sort of tells us that dissent is really important. Uh, this is not just uh, registering a uh, official uh, disagreement with something. Uh, this is actually charting a path to to a better, uh, a better outcome in the future. A as to Harlan's significance, um, I would refer again to the, the sort of long tunnel of years. You know, it's been between 100 and 150 years since these decisions took place. And we now know what was important and what wasn't important of those years on the, the Waite Court and the Fuller Court. Um, and the two things that stand out are that was the era when uh, segregation began, which has had a, a terrible effect on our civic life and continues to have a terrible effect on our civic life, the legacy of segregation. Uh, but it also was a time of tremendous uh, economic inequality. And you know, you have to ask yourself, well, how did how did we get to a position where you know some peoples uh, are building castles on the Hudson and other people were living uh, five and six to a room despite having jobs and working? And, you know, the answer to that it traces back to these Supreme Court decisions. Um, and if you look at the sort of full range of Harlan's dissents, he'll say not only in Plessy, but look at the civil rights cases of 1883, look at the Berea College case, look at Giles v. Harris. Harlan's uh, uh, forceful dissents on, on race really uh, contrasted with that of the majority and, and identified correctly all of the problems that society was destined to face. Also, when the Supreme Court found kind of, you know, dubious fig leaf reasons to declare the Sherman Antitrust Act unconstitutional initially in the uh, E.C. Knight case and to declare the income tax unconstitutional in Pollock and to turn in Lochner and uh, tie the hands of state legislatures for certain kinds of uh, legislation for health and safety, um, Harlan called them out. And uh, I think those dissents as well had been vindicated over time. So. You, you can now say, well, okay, we know he was right. And then we say, well, what was the key to his difference? You know, how did he see things so much more clearly when, as, as Vic was alluding earlier, uh, you know, the court majority was in a completely different place. The country was in a different place. So he, he's an impressive figure. Now, how much of his outlook was, was shaped by his nationalist views based on his being from a border state of Kentucky, being a protege and family friend of Henry Clay and uh, choosing to, to fight on the Union side uh, during the Civil War. Huge, uh, he was hugely affected by it. Uh, this was a man who uh, was named after John Marshall, the great Chief Justice. Uh, he grew up in an extremely patriotic family, uh, a family that really took to heart. His father was pretty much the leading lawyer in Kentucky, but a, a family that really took to heart uh, the notion of what we today would call American exceptionalism. But, you know, in his time, he was he was in, uh, you know, intensely aware of the idea that democracy was rare, that, you know, the America was standing out. Every, the rest of the world was ruled by various forms of monarchy and despotism. And, you know, America was this great experiment. So he was a strong, strong believer in the principles behind the Declaration of Independence, the principles behind the Constitution. He also grew up completely under the shadow of this looming civil war. And just like Henry Clay and other uh, Kentuckians, leading Kentuckians, his family um, believed that Kentucky would be destroyed by this war, both because of geography as a border state, but also because it was half, half Northern and half Southern sympathies. 
so its civic fabric would be destroyed. So they had this sense that they were going to be the victims of everything that was uh, transpiring in both North and South. And that's obviously why Henry Clay and other Kentuckians were at the forefront of all of the compromises that were attempted to try to resolve the sectional dispute over slavery. And so Harlan uh, grew up in an atmosphere where he believed that politics was, was sort of going crazy and law would be the only source of compromise, the only source of solution. And I think that, um, uh, you know, that's part of the John Marshall legacy. You know, that's why he was named for uh, the chief justice who declared the supremacy of law over politics. And, um, and then all of this leads up to the Dred Scott decision uh, where Harlan, I think, came to believe in his bones, even though he articulated some different things. He tried to push the idea that Dred Scott could resolve things initially, but then for all of the rest of his life, cited Dred Scott as a, a terrible example of the Supreme Court going awry, but it gave him this sense of, of the stakes in these Supreme Court decisions. So when people say, where did he get the courage to dissent? Where did he get the, the courage of his convictions? It was because he understood that, you know, there was a finality to the Supreme Court decisions that is unique in American life. And that after Dred Scott, he felt like all those compromises that he had fought for were now impossible and the nation was on a path to war. It's interesting you should mention Dred Scott because I think probably the, the dissent by Benjamin Curtis in Dred Scott is the first great dissent that, that people know of that before dissents were very short things, uh, just saying I, I don't agree and, and giving very little reason. But but the, the evisceration of the of the majority opinion by Benjamin Curtis showing on how on, on originalism grounds there were actually freed black citizens who participated in, in, in uh, the body politic at the time that the Constitution was ratified. Uh, it was a, was a very important uh, deci uh, decision, a very important opinion, and, and may well, I think, have, uh, have served as an exemplar for, uh, for Harlan when he had the courage to write his dissents, often by himself. I, I think that's true. I think the big difference with Curtis was that Curtis resigned in protest while mm -hmm. you know, Harlan stayed for... Uh, 28 years after his first big dissent in uh, in the civil rights cases of 1883, and was sort of this constant present. But I, I agree with you that Curtis's dissent would have been uh, strongly strongly on his mind, uh, and obviously his his family also were very very skeptical of Justice Taney and saw him as sort of the uh, you know Democrat you you know usurper of of Marshall's throne there. So uh, so yes, you would have identified strongly with Curtis. Yeah, yeah. Other than other than that dissent, I guess the uh, the uh, Chief Justice uh, Marshall's dissent in Ogden versus Sanders is the only other one that I can think of from from per earlier that that stands out at all. But anyway, well, uh, in addition to being uh, from Kentucky in a border state, he was also obviously from a slaveholding state, and in fact from a slaveholding family. And uh, one of the prominent figures in your book, uh, your book is in part a biography, not just of Mar of John Marshall Harlan but also of Robert Harlan, who was a, as a, grew, grew up essentially as, the, as an elder brother, was treated as an elder brother in the family. Could you explain uh, Robert Harlan and his significance on John Marshall Harlan's career and, and possibly his uh, thought? Yeah, uh, Robert Harlan was a, a, a very powerful and intriguing character in his own right. Uh, he journeyed, he was born in Virginia, enslaved in Virginia, traveled with his mother over 450 miles to by all these later accounts, because he became involved in politics, we we know from a lot of uh, profiles that were written in the newspaper. He, he he came 450 miles to find his father, went to Harlan Station, which was essentially a family town in Kentucky. So I think we can assume that they believed his father was a was a member of the Harlan family, and he ended up through mysterious circumstances we don't completely know, being owned by by uh, James Harlan, who was the father of John Harlan before John's birth. And um, uh, while his mother uh, remained enslaved and, and was sent down south, but apparently still exchanged some letters with James Harlan and remained on, on solid terms with James Harlan. And apparently right from the start, uh, Robert, who was a mixed race, uh, 
uh, was treated very differently from the other enslaved people in the family. James Harlan tried to educate him, but that was impossible for a person who was uh, black and enslaved at the time. You're trying to uh, get him enrolled in school, right? The school wouldn't get him enrolled him. in school. Yeah, he was he was educated at home, but they, you know, uh, James Harlan wanted him to go to school, and he wasn't able to go to school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, paradoxically, the fact that he wasn't able to go to school liberated him from one aspect of the Harlan family because there were uh, five brothers that John had uh, of, of his own, all white brothers, who um, obviously were not enslaved and who uh, were committed to this sort of rigorous study of the law by their father from the time they were very, very young. Robert uh, was able to sort of develop a skill that was to hold him in very good stead later in life by necessity, and that is finding ways to succeed in opportunities, even against the most uh, horrific odds, you know, being born enslaved, being denied any form of education, being denied anything. So he started off as a horse racing pioneer because uh, many of the original um, horse racing owners in Kentucky uh, were slave owners and their enslaved men were the jockeys and trainers. So it was a very multiracial scene there. And uh, Robert developed this reputation for being able to size up a horse on site. And he was actually would help organize sort of barnstorming style races. Um, then he spotted the gold rush as another opportunity, uh, understanding that the old kind of racial prejudices that held people back uh, would not be in place in San Francisco, where you had people coming from all around the world to try to find gold. He returned from the gold rush, a very wealthy man, and moved to Cincinnati, which at the time was the terminus of the Underground Railroad. This is before the Fugitive Slave Act. And um, in the early 1850s, began investing in black owned businesses, seeing real potential in people coming out of slavery. Uh, and these ranged from a grocer, <laughs> something as simple as a grocer, uh, to something as complicated as a group of uh, black photography pioneers, uh, recognizing again that you know new technology was something that would be less encumbered by racial barriers. Uh, and also he owned the mortgage or held part of the mortgage on uh, something called the Dumas House, which was the leading hostelry for, for, for free black men during that time. And um, where a lot of runaway slaves were held, uh, were, were sort of hidden and, and, and stayed uh, after the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, so Robert Harlan then spent the Civil War years in England becoming a rather well-known person uh, because he owned horses in Kentucky by then and brought them to England to stage these transatlantic races uh, and became well-known in British racing circles. Uh, then returned after the war, uh, to uh, assume a position as the leading black politician in Ohio, uh, and certainly the leading supporter of the Republican Party in Ohio. Uh, and because Ohio was the swing state in presidential politics, and because uh, the black vote was very crucial to the Republican Party, he, he was, you know, a confederate in some ways of, of all of the great, you know, Ohio politicians, many of them on the national stage. Hayes certainly uh, James Garfield, certainly McKinley, Benjamin Harrison. He was uh, he was a well-known person person to them. And so after the war, when John Harlan is considered for the Supreme Court under this this very odd set of circumstances, where Hayes has been given the presidency, but sort of committed behind the scenes to appointing a Southerner, but he needed a Southerner who was good on civil rights, who could pass a, a Senate Judiciary Committee that was run by George Edmonds of Vermont, who was a dedicated civil rights supporter. Um, there was a lot of politics going on in the background, and Robert Harlan was playing a role in advocating for John. We don't know how much of a role that was. We don't know. Uh, we do know that he said we said be sending letters back reporting to John on, on his chances of getting the nomination. Uh, but I think we can imagine that in that atmosphere, Robert's support meant a lot, you know, for people who are actually doubting uh, Harlan's commitment to civil rights, given that he came from a slave owning family, but to have someone who was enslaved in the same house, who was then the leading uh, black politician in Ohio vouching for him, I think was very, very important. Uh, so they worked together, they maintained a sense of family loyalty and family feeling. So it's quite an extraordinary part of the Harlan story. And the experience of, of uh... Justice Harlan, growing up with Robert Harlan and, and knowing him for for probably uh, most most of his uh, 
adult or his entire adult life and, and probably half of the life before that uh, may well have contributed, uh, would it not, to, to Harlan's view on the different races and his, his belief that in, in racial equality, uh, which uh, I think is a, is a good uh, reason for us now to turn to, to Plessy and the civil rights cases in particular and talk, you know, because those are, are the the first big great dissents uh, from Justice Harlan, uh, the things that he's, he's most known for today. If you could uh, talk a little bit about those cases and about how, how Harlan uh, uh, came to his position. Well, Harlan, Harlan came to his position, um, I think, because of all of all of those factors we've discussed and, and many others. Um, I, I think that having pushed for those compromises uh, in the years leading up to the Civil War, but finding that they failed, um, having watched the Ku Klux Klan take over Kentucky in a lot of ways after the war, having also recognized, because he was on this Louisiana commission that had looked into a, a bitter dispute over the gubernatorial election in, in Louisiana that almost erupted into another war, he came away with a belief that uh, you, couldn't, you couldn't keep troops in the South forever, uh, but that the law had to step in when the, uh, you know, the, the, the force of the country could, could not uh, could not apply that the law had to do what the troops were doing uh, for many years after civil after the Civil War, um, and he civil was rights, uh, civil rights uh, cases of uh, of 1883. Those dealt with the congressional reaction uh, to the plight of, of freed uh, men and women, in which uh, Congress had passed a law forbidding segregation in in, in public accommodations in the theater. Uh, in, in public railroads and, and things like that. Uh, it, it purported to act uh, directly against uh, what private businesses might be doing, right? Absolutely. And um, this was the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1875. Mm -hmm. And um, the, but the, set, the setting for it, which was sort of important, is you know, here you have South, Harlan is the only Southerner. He's from Kentucky. He's also the only person, as you were mentioning, who had real personal relationships with African Americans. You had these northern justices, many of them came from corporate backgrounds, but who had very little exposure to African-Americans. And they, you know, the country and I think the justice in the Supreme Court were getting a little bit tired of uh, what, what was uh, an ongoing sectional sort of dispute and looking for ways to try to resolve it. So this, the uh, Civil Rights Act that was passed in uh, the Grant administration in 1875 became this, this huge political issue within the country. And cases piled up both in the North and South where individual innkeepers, uh, individual uh, restaurateurs, uh, you know, train porters uh, and conductors, uh, theater operators refused to serve African-Americans and the law was, was deployed against them. And all these cases were then combined into one requiem. Unlike Plessy, which was not a very well-known case in its time, the Civil Rights case of 1883 was a real national requiem. You know, I would say almost all Americans were aware that this was going on, and it was seen as a big front page problem. news, front page news everywhere. And uh, Harlan, up until that point, had been a fairly, you know, undistinguished, cooperative sort of junior member of the Supreme Court. Um, I think that there was a lot of pressure uh, from the. Uh, the court majority to try to to try to have a, a majority ruling in this big case that was uh, famous across the country uh, and attracting so much attention. Uh, but Harlan decided to break very powerfully from his uh, his colleagues. This was not just you know registering a, a, an official kind of uh, disagreement. Uh, he felt that he needed to articulate an entirely different way of interpreting the post-war uh, war amendments. Uh, the majority opinion by Justice Bradley uh, leaned heavily on the state action uh, argument, saying that the post-war amendments were only intended to restrict, to restrict state action and that uh, the types of cases across the board that were brought in were discrimination by individuals, uh, therefore, they were a state matter to be dealt with. This is simplifying it to some degree, but you know the state act. You know, state action was the key here, and um, none of these cases had the requisite state action. Harlan, who uh, you know understood this was only uh, 15 years after the ratification of these amendments, 
you know, he, he was in personal contact with the framers of these amendments. He knew what was intended by these amendments. And he knew that the court was uh, deploying an extremely narrow interpretation that, in his view, defeated the purpose of these uh, of these amendments. So in his view, so, before yeah. under slavery, uh, slavery and the status of people as slaves was the bar that prevented them from being able to go to the theater and being able to go to the restaurants, being able to, to ride on on buses and, or, and trains or, or stagecoaches or what have you, and that that once slavery was officially eradicated, that this can, that these aspects, this exclusion that continued was a sort of a badge or servitude of slavery that he believed was addressed directly by the 13th Amendment, right? Yes. And he, he rested, he, you know, he came up with arguments related to the 13th, 14th Amendments and even the Commerce Clause, which uh, ultimately would become the, the source of a civil rights bill in the 1960s. But um Yes, he said that the 13th Amendment uh, was uh, intended, obviously, to ban uh, badges of servitude and that denying uh, Black people access to what he's, he was thinking is kind of the rudiments of normal life and commerce uh, was indeed a badge of servitude. Mm -hmm. uh, he also said in the uh, 14th Amendment that people were guaranteed a certain uh, liberty interest that was being defeated by uh, by by these uh, uh, attempts to discriminate based on race. Uh, and uh, he said that in the uh, Commerce Clause, uh, you know, at that time, the government was uh, backing bonds for expanding uh, railroad networks around the country and things like that. And it, with the dynamic changes in the economy, it was worth exploring whether Congress would have the power under the Commerce Clause mm -hmm. to impose uh, such civil rights restrictions. So his opinion in in uh, the civil rights cases was not as pithy, not as soaring as his dissent in Plessy. It had some soaring element, but I think he felt he felt the tremendous burden that you know here he has to articulate a different set of interpretations of these post-war amendments and the Commerce Clause, for that matter, and. Um, uh, and it, it's it's something that you know people have a lot of different opinions on. I've heard some people say you know Harlan's dissent in in uh, the civil rights cases was all over the place, but I also have heard people say lawyers talk about it as as absolutely brilliant in terms of anticipating where the law was going to go in the thirteenth, fourteenth amendments as well as the commerce clause. Um, the so, question of symbolism was that the one in which he used the inkwell that had belonged to? Uh, yes, he did, and, and here he was. Uh, this was a very difficult time in his in his life. His eldest daughter had died uh, shortly after giving birth to a baby, and she was very much the light of their whole family. And he wrote a letter to his sons saying, um, "Every day of his life would be spent vindicating her tremendous spirit and her tremendous." Uh, legacy, spiritual legacy. And um, one of the things she had done was teach uh, the children of freed men and women in a volunteer program in Washington, D.C. So that may have also been, been on his mind. And they're in a house that they would soon leave because they felt the ghosts of this daughter they had lost was so present in their lives. So he's, he's holed up in a study and he's trying to do this, this piece of work that is going to define his career and separate him from his colleagues once and for all. And uh, he was struggling with it. And his wife brings in the, uh, the inkwell that Harlan himself had saved from some court, you know, reorganization or something like that, uh, that had been Justice Tawney's inkwell that he had used to write the Dred Scott opinion. And she said that she very quietly just put it on his desk. And as soon as he started using that ink, you know, the pen started, started flowing across the page. And now Plessy, you just said uh, in Plessy, he used much more soaring language than the notion of the, of the Constitution being colorblind, not admitting of races. Uh, but uh, that one all clearly involved uh, state action. That was the uh, state of Louisiana telling the railroads that they had to have separate cars for white people and black people, right? Absolutely. And um, uh, I think that it's very, very rare in any legal opinion to see somebody reach so deep into the sort of foundational principles of American law as Harlan did there. Uh, you know, clearly he felt not only that the majority opinion was wrong on the law and violating the post-war amendments, but it was violating the whole core uh, principle of equality under which the United States was, was founded. 
And the lines from that case, you quoted one of them, you know, the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The, the humblest is the peer of the most powerful. There is no caste here. You know, these are strong, forceful statements that sort of resound through the ages uh, and, and represent the extent to which Harlan felt that these, these restrictions on African-American rights were so deeply offensive to the entire American system. He also articulated in that opinion, uh, as he often did, his predictions sort of for the future. And he predicted, you know, he said, what can more surely sow the seeds of race hate than an enactment based like this one upon the idea that one group of citizens is so degraded that they cannot travel in the railroad car of another? Uh, he predicted that that far from resolving anything, Plessy v. Ferguson was going to be the source of racial discord for the rest of the time and consigning both white and black Americans to, to years of, of pain. Uh, so it's it's an extraordinary document, his, his dissent. And it is the thing that has most resonated at the time. When he died in 1911, uh, there was a memorial service at, at Metropolitan AME, which is the largest black mm -hmm. church still right here in Washington. And um, there were a thousand people, all African-Americans there, and his dissents were read aloud. Mm -hmm. And if you put yourself in the mindset of like a young person listening to those words, it, it does several things. It, it it gives you some hope. You know, it makes you believe that there are white people out there who can see things through the eyes of African Americans, but also that that perhaps these cases could be changed. And you know, Thurgood Marshall was not there. He was born a couple of years later, but he also adopted Harlan as a role model and followed the Plessy the Plessy descent. Uh, Constance Baker Motley says it was his Bible, uh, and they included it in all of their. Um, the NAACP Defense Fund included it in all of their uh, briefs in the cases uh, leading up to Brown, including Brown. So, uh, so Harlan played a significant role in sort of germinating the uh, the legal strategy behind the 20th century civil rights movement. Now, before we uh, oh, yeah. we call Josh in here, one one other uh, matter I wanted to you to, to touch on a case that I found uh, quite astounding and. Uh, in, in horrifying in some ways, uh, but uh, gratifying in others, I suppose, uh, that you, you wrote about a very obscure case uh, involving Sheriff Ship in Chattanooga, where there was uh, an incident where, the, where a poor fellow had been accused, a poor black man had been accused of a, of a rape that he didn't commit and was railroaded through a very uh, improper procedure. And his, uh, his uh, lawyers come to D.C., because the circuit and comes to come to Harlan's house because Harlan's the circuit judge overseeing Kentucky and delivers a uh, application for writ of habeas corpus to try to get the Supreme Court to uh, take the case. And what, what ensued from that is sort of like a, almost like a, a mind boggling. Uh, can you explain that case? Yeah, what happens is, is, first of all, the context for this is up to that point, the Supreme Court had been very, very reluctant to clamp down on improper state procedures that were harming a lot of defendants uh, throughout the South, throughout other states. It just was very hands off in its approach there. So here Harlan orders a review of uh, the documentation, you know, a couple of a hearing a couple of days later uh, in this case. Uh, and it was seen by official Chattanooga as such an affront, such a desperate affront that immediately Harlan and the Supreme Court become the issue more than uh, the, the rape case at hand. And the sheriff, who has been sort of officially deputized to now hold a federal prisoner, he um, he uh, manages to leave the jail completely unguarded, except for a 73-year-old night watchman. Uh, this in a case where mobs have already been gathering repeatedly in front of this jail uh, and allows essentially a mob to take the prisoner and lynch him on the most prominent public structure in Cincinnati uh, before hundreds of people. Um, and Harlan then uh, rallies the Supreme Court to be willing to hold the local officials accountable and some of the perpetrators for the crime. So Sheriff Shipp and a group of other uh, defendants have to come to Washington to uh, uh, have face contempt of court charges. And the um, court was being tried in the Supreme Court. 
by and the Supreme Court. This was the Court. first and only time, and this was the problem, obviously, with the Supreme Court, is that they had no enforcement mechanism. There wasn't a giant FBI. There wasn't a giant federal court system at the time. So uh, they had to sit as a jury, and there was an initial decision in which Holmes wrote the opinion that uh, that the jury requirement was satisfied by the nine justices of the Supreme Court, which I think some people would want to take a close look at that one. Uh, but afterwards, it was a fairly easy call to convict Sheriff Ship and uh, another group of men uh, who were, were co-conspirators uh, for, for this horrific lynching. What this did is it, it's a deceptively important case. It's kind of been forgotten in all the case books because it doesn't have a lot of legal precedent because it was a weird situation where the court was uh, sitting as a trial court, the Supreme Court was sitting as a trial, trial court. Uh, but it gained a lot of uh, uh, sort of significance in, in Chattanooga and in Tennessee and around the country uh, in recent years, because for one thing, it established a record of all that went into to a lynching. And while we know there were thousands of lynchings in the United States, this is the best documented one. It and it was actually Ed, was was Ed Johnson. Ed Johnson, yes. yes. Ed Johnson was the victim. And... Um, they recently dedicated in September. I was there a, a, a memorial right at the uh, at the bridge where he was where he was lynched. Um, a memorial to Ed Johnson with obviously a significant um, uh, amount of tribute to Harlan as well, um, and uh, a lot of senior African American jurists were there saying, you know, this was the first time that Black people really saw the Supreme Court acting on their behalf, and. Uh, uh, you know, obviously saw Harlan as the key figure in this, uh, and it it attests again to his uh, his willingness to call out injustice in very difficult situations. Now, uh, we talked about the the wide admiration that people have for for uh, Justice Harlan and the uh, dissents. Uh, some of the dissents he's had not all of the, not all of the dissents have been uh, uh, unanimously agreed with. However. Uh, I'd like to talk, turn to Josh Blackman now. Uh, Josh, if you would want to talk a little bit about one of the one of the more controversial dissents in the Lochner case. Sure. And again, thank you, uh, Judge Walski and Peter, for this this enlightening conversation. Um, Harlan's most famous opinion is plus people know they don't know the law, uh, but among lawyers, his probably most significant dissent came in a case from 1905. Called Lochner versus New York. We all know the facts of the case. New York put restrictions on bake shops. One of the restrictions was limiting how many hours the bakers can work. The Supreme Court upheld most of the restrictions, for example, those involving sanitation. You had to have clean floors, you can have animals. Those were all fine. But the hour law was restricted. The court was 5 4. Justice Peckham wrote your opinion, and he found that the um, restriction on hours was a violation of the liberty of contract. Um, there were four dissenters. One dissent was written by Justice Harlan, another dissent by Justice Holmes. Now, people always know the Holmes dissent because he had these references to Herbert Spencer, social statics, and these charges of laissez faire governance. Uh, but Holmes was by himself, no one joined him, right? Holmes basically said, there is no liberty of contract. The 14th Amendment says nothing at all about this. We should simply defer if it can be said this policy is reasonable. The dissent that garnered more votes was Harlan. He was joined by two others. Harlan seemed to accept that the 14th Amendment had what we would now call a substantive component. The phrase substantive due process didn't exist in the 1800s. That, that was a modern uh, phrase. Uh, but Harlan seemed to exist that, yes, there's some laws that might violate the liberty of contract. This ain't it. Um, Harlan sort of applied what we might call a presumption of constitutionality that could be rebutted. He says, well, when we're dealing with these unenumerated rights, we should presume that the legislature is acting rationally. Um, we'll presume it. If there's evidence, bring it forward to show us this law is irrational, but we presume it. The Harlan dissent provided the basis for the New Deal jurisprudence. Right? We talk about overruling Lochner. That never actually happened. But if you read West Coast Hotel, be parished and other related cases, the court was sounding in Harlan. Now, you need to read Lochner 
with another case decided in 1905, indeed a few uh, months later, which was Jacobson. Uh, this is a case that's been widely misunderstood and misread by judges of all stripes. I could do an entire hour, and I won't. Uh, but Harlan wrote both the Lochner dissent and the Jacobson majority. And the Jacobson majority upheld a Massachusetts law that imposed a $5 penalty on those who did not get a smallpox vaccine. And the sort of deference we see in the Lochner case, in the Lochner dissent, I think it's the same sort of deference we see in the Jacobson case. But cases recognize there is some sort of liberty, there's some right, and the policy must be rational. It can be reviewed by courts for rationality. So these two, dis, uh, these two opinions, a Lochner, majority, a Lochner dissent and the Jacobson majority decided within months of each other in 1905 are very significant windows into Justice Harlan's jurisprudence. Thank you. Peter, anything you want to add about Lochner? I know that you, you viewed Lochner through, through the, the prism of the the conflict between the rapidly industrializing America and uh, the people who were concerned about uh, health and safety and sanitary conditions and, and things of that nature. And I guess in, in Lochner, uh, not wanting to question the motives of the legislatures, the uh, Justice Harlan was was deferential uh, and believed that that was a, that there was a legitimate health and safety issue involved, but also recognized the liberty of contract. Right. Well, it. Yes, in both in both cases, and uh, uh, you know he he articulated a position as as uh, as as Josh Blackman suggested that it's actually very similar to the way that the current court uh, views the you know the rational basis test. Um, I think that uh, the other thing that's that's uh, significant about his his views in um, in Lochner is that they showed another side to Harlan. You know, we think of Harlan in terms of Plessy, where he's asserting a right and and uh, overturning a legislative action. He actually was quite deferential to le legislatures, and and this is another facet of his his upbringing. He believed that in a democracy, in a democratic government, uh, the Congress and the legislatures needed to have the tools to sort of wrestle with big national problems. And that I think is also a legacy of that period growing up under the threat of the Civil War coming. So he actually spent a lot of his career uh, defending the notion of judicial restraint and uh, you know, imploring colleagues not to, to have their own political judgment replace that of uh, the political branches. Uh, and that's very visible in his, in his locker. Now, in, in the uh, uh, judicial uh, philosophy uh, department, there, uh, judicial restraint. Would, uh, Josh, would you would you say that that uh, Justice Harlan might have been a progenitor of the thought of, say, Felix Frankfurter and that 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 type of approach to uh, to to judging? Or well, I think the leading of restraint was actually Thayer, who was one of the leading scholars at the time, and Thayer and Holmes lined it pretty carefully that unless some laws palpably Constitutional, the court should leave it alone. I don't think Harlan went quite that far. I think he had a, a, a broader willingness to assess if laws were unconstitutional, um, look no further than Plessy or the civil rights cases. He took acts of Congress to be unconstitutional. He took uh, Louisiana segregation laws invalid. So I think Holmes would have upheld both. I think Holmes would have said, yep, Plessy, go for it. And, and yep, uh, uh, you know, civil rights, that's not, you know, I, th I think Holmes would have been okay in both of those. So Harlan really has this intermediate, what we call presumption of constitutionality. I do want to mention one other thing that, that in my own experiences that people may not know, but Harlan, he was a professor. Um, during his tenure, he taught at the George Washington Law School, the Columbia uh, Law School, in evenings and weekends to, to basically students with full-time careers. And he would teach con law. Can you imagine having a sitting Supreme Court justice teaching you about the constitution? And often talk about his cases before they decide. And decide you say things like, well, I was in dissent, so I was wrong. Um, <laughs> so obviously it, he was wrong, right? Because the Supreme yeah, Court spoke and he was up. Of voting. course. And one of his students in 1897 transcribed his notes verbatim. And I actually went to the Library of Congress with a colleague and we actually digitized them. So if you want to I'll put the link in the chat, uh, read all of Harlan's lecture notes. They were truly remarkable. He would teach the Constitution, not by cases, but by clause, starting with the preamble and working through each clause. Uh, 
Um, I actually took some pedagogical tips from John Harlan. So I feel, uh, I feel forever in debt for him. So he might be one of the original textualists. I think he was a proto originalist. Uh, you, you should also read uh, the, the law review article that uh, Josh and Brian Fry wrote on those, uh, uh, those Thank lectures you. that, that Harlan gave. Uh, it's a, it's very, very illuminating in terms of his judicial philosophy, but also his personality, just like the, as Josh was suggesting with him always joking, he said, well, this was my view, but I guess I was wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> now, some, some of his other, some of his other dissents, I think, uh, and, and unfortunately, some of his joining of majority opinions had tend, uh, ended up being somewhat controversial, particularly the Chinese exclusion cases, I think, uh, have been viewed as problematic by people uh, of, of, our, of our generation, I suppose. Uh, maybe not, not obviously not I, I so mean, at the time. You know, people frequently uh, ask about that when talking about Harlan. Um, I, I think it's worth noting that the Che Chen Ping case, which was the, Chinese, the main Chinese exclusion case, um, is still good law today. I mean, the only legal issue in that case was whether Congress can abrogate a treaty once it's been ratified. And that is still good law today. Uh, the so he rested, majority- he rested his decisions on, on treaty power and on, on, the, immigra- on the, the ability of Congress to limit immigration, right? Those were, well, it was the ability of Congress to limit, to limit Im- immigration, but, um, but, but this, the entire Chinese uh, worker system was, was the product of a treaty that was, that was a, uh, you know, that, that had the Chinese workers in this country remaining uh, subjects of the Chinese emperor. I, I think that, you know, people look at this case and they'll look at some language and other um, Harlan opinions and things and sort of say, well, did he have a special uh, bias against the Chinese? I, I think that, first of all, if you look at the totality of his opinions, um, he was the person who stood up for the rights of uh, Filipinos and Hawaiian, native Filipinos and Hawaiians uh, in the insular cases very strongly. And, and those uh, are the cases which involve the territories that we acquired during the Spanish-American War and whether or not constitutional rights not necessarily flowed to the people who lived there once they became part of the United States. Yeah, and he, he was the leader of the legal, you know, Constitution must follow the flag, and and in fact, it's very powerful because he, he you can tell that he sees the same seeds of discord in those cases that led to the Civil War. You know, and he kept saying, "We cannot have a system in which half of the people living under the American flag, or a large portion of them living under the American flag, are you know have full constitutional rights, where the the Constitution is the supreme authority." And then you have this large number, millions of people living under the power of the United States, in which Congress is the uh, supreme authority. Uh, he saw it as another revival of the old cancer of inequality. Mm-hmm. But he also, you know, many of the majority opinions had had very racially problematic views about the capacities of Hawaiians and Filipinos to live in a free society and things like that. And, and Harlan rejected those notions and said the Constitution should follow the flag and they should have full constitutional rights. He also defended the right of a, a Native American to obtain birthright citizenship if they made a decision to leave their tribal government and assert birthright, birthright citizenship. So it, it's improbable to say that he had this strong equal rights ideology for all these other groups, but not the Chinese. Mm-hmm. But the difference in the Chinese case was that they were not American citizens. They were, uh, and, and he noted that in various points, you know, they were subjects of the Chinese uh, emperor. And so the legal- and that, even included, and that even included the fellow who was born in America to Chinese parents and lived here for 20 some years before he, he emigrated back for a time to China, right? That was the- Well, he joined, Harlan joined a dissent in that case by Fuller. There was a, this was a case in which um, uh, the court granted birthright citizenship to a, 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 a Chinese person. He joined with, uh, with Fuller, uh, citing a doctrine dating back to common law days that you had to make an affirmative choice to become a US citizen. Mm-hmm. If um, if the parents had wanted their son to be a U.S. citizen, if that was part of the plan, uh, that was Harlan's view on birthright citizenship as as well as Fuller's view, um, not that it would just occur sort of automatically. And in fact, in one of the lectures that uh, that's in Josh's article, Harlan posits the idea of a British couple coming to Hot Springs and then uh, having a child here because of at that time, obviously, you couldn't go back to England at that point but with no intention of renouncing their loyalty to the crown, you know, does, does that child become an American just because their parents were on a trip to the United States when it was born? 
uh, he would say no under those uh, statutes. And that's a, that's a little more of an outlying opinion. And he did join Fuller in, in that. Um, but you want to go to Q&A? We have about 10 minutes left. Maybe we should take some questions. Okay, so we got, uh, can you see the questions, uh, Josh and Peter? I can. Okay, why don't yeah. we handle the, the first question we have about uh, Harlan's deferential pro approach he took to due process in Lochner, whether that's at odds with his approach to the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, Josh, do you have a... Sure, and I think that's from uh, uh, Chris, who seems to be here in Houston with me um, at St. Thomas. Uh, I think Harlan's view of the Due Process Clause was largely based on the fact that it was unenumerated, right? What is the meaning of liberty? One of his final exams, I have, I have his final exam, was, what does liberty mean in the 14th Amendment? I don't know. No, ask Justice Kennedy, right? Um, and I think Harlan was very hesitant when he's dealing with this sort of unenumerated concept of liberty to sort of be engaged and to sort of reach beyond um, the text of the Constitution. But equal protection is clear as day, right? I mean, he uh, uh, he, he he seemed to he seemed to think that he knew what equal protection meant. He lived through the Civil War. He he understood what Reconstruction was. He knew what it meant. So he wasn't as as hesitant. Mm -hmm. um, the second part says ignorance of Harlan's arguments through the colorblind constitution point to his favor. Ah, so, you know, the most famous line, the Harlan dissent is we want a constitution that's colorblind. And today that's not quite woke enough, right? Um, many people who are progressive want a color conscious race, color conscious approach to a college admissions, for example. Oh God, color conscious approach to college admissions, right? Um, you have Justice Thomas dissenting, saying we need to be race blind. And Justice Thomas compares those who favor those who favor protection to the segregationist town. So I got to tell you, Harlan has been a little bit of rough sledding recently because people don't like race neutrality. It doesn't actually work. They want race consciousness. So I think if we go back to Harlan, the OG, we may get some may get some guidance and, and some clarity. Peter, what do you? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add one thing that Thurgood Marshall, while he was in his last years on the court, uh, was asked about this, uh, how he as a Harlan admirer could support affirmative action. And he, he said, because the country didn't follow Harlan in uh, Plessy in 1896 means that now in 1987, we have to undo the ills of the intervening period. Uh, so he sort of squared it by talking about the remedial nature of affirmative action and saying that, uh, uh, you know, he, in his view, Harlan would not be offended by affirmative action. Now, uh, Justice Harlan served on the Supreme Court with some uh, towering uh, figures on, in court history, including uh, in his early part of his career with uh, Stephen J. Field, whose, whose memorial actually towers over John Marshall Harlan's uh, simple flat gravestone in the Rock Creek Cemetery, uh, where, where they both happen to be buried a, a few miles from here. Uh, another one was, uh, was the fellow who, who wrote short, cranky, but pithy things that got a lot of uh, attention, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Now, bet as between Holmes and Harlan, uh, Peter, who, who do you think uh, was, was the, the greater justice? Uh, I think that Harlan was the greater justice. I think that you can refer to a Louise Weinberg uh, article on this question of looking at, uh, at Holmes. Did, not specifically positing Holmes versus Harlan. It's, it's more in a, a critical analysis of Holmes, but it it does uh, offer the opinion that Harlan was a greater justice and that, uh, you know, Holmes has kind of impressed the legal world with his doctrinal brilliance and his, which he, the glittering aphorisms, you know, that he would, he would cite, whereas Harlan had this sort of firmer sense of, sense of justice. Uh, you know, you were mentioning earlier some of the um, Chinese cases, and he he joined that Fuller opinion um, uh, as well that was seen as problematic or racially problematic. But if those uh, are among the very, very few perceived blemishes on his record, uh, you know, compare it to the cases where today we would say Holmes was completely wrong. You know, Holmes was writing cases that had people who were uh, protesting the war peacefully outside of an induction center uh, being put in jail. You know, he was um, uh, in the um, the eugenics case, he was supporting mass sterilization. You know, it's a, there's a lot of, of very bad Har uh, Holmes opinions. And some of the opinions in which Harlan's dissents now uh, loom large, like the Berea College case, which banned interracial education, even in private colleges in separate ways, 
Holmes was on the wrong side, you know. So, uh, so I, I do believe that uh, Harlan surpasses Holmes. Now, well, your your book focuses primarily on the dissents. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a few of the majority opinions that uh, Justice Harlan wrote that were particularly significant uh, in the areas of property rights. Uh, for instance, he wrote the opinion in Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad Company versus Chicago, which was the first case to incorporate one of the provisions of the Bill of Rights, the takings clause, into the 14th Amendment. He also wrote uh, Smith versus Ames, which adopted the standard of a fair return on the present value of assets of a railroad as constitutionally required under the takings clause. He wrote Adair versus United States, which struck down a federal statute that had banned the uh, so-called yellow dog contracts, the, the non-union contracts, and he struck that down, violating liberty of contract. So, uh, with that, with that also that record and, and on the side of economic rights, one wonders where would he have fallen, perhaps, if he was still on the court at the time of Wickard versus Filburn? Would he have agreed with? Uh, would would his his deference to the legislature allowed it to happen, or would he instead have uh, leaned the other way? Peter, uh, uh, Josh, uh, I'll, I'll I'll take it. That's actually an excellent question. In one of Harlan's lectures for students, he told them, "When you guys become lawyers." pay very close attention to the commerce. He said that would be the most important part of the Constitution for the next century. He said this very clearly. And if you read his dissent in the lottery, uh, the lottery, or his opinion in the lottery cases, it more or less presages how the New Deal Court read federal power of the commerce necessary and proper clause. Uh, he has an entire lecture on uh, what happens when we have, you know, the steam rails that didn't exist at the time of the framing. He understood very clearly where things were going. Um, and I think that uh, the New Deal justices didn't always give him credit. By the way, Holmes is so overrated. Oh my goodness. He doesn't deserve nearly the credit he gets. He was a hero, patriot, shot in the battlefield, but his opinions were poorly reasoned consistently. He had a good, good turn of phrase, but I will take Harlan over Holmes any day. Well, Dick, you also, you also alluded. You know, get down, you fool, at, at Abraham Lincoln when uh, snipers were shooting uh, during the Civil War. <laughs> Well, Holmes, you know, interestingly, Holmes never had a good word to say about anybody. You know, when people talk about the first class temperament comment about Franklin Roosevelt, they forget the rest of it. But second class intellect, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, that was Holmes, and Holmes attacked Lincoln. And Holmes also had some funny uh, comments about Harlan calling him the last of the tobacco spitting judges. But um, uh, you alluded to another aspect of Harlan's career that we, we don't have much time to talk about now, and that is his his support for the incorporation doctrine. Um you know, he was considered way, way an outlier in his time, suggesting that the Bill of Rights was incorporated as applied to states uh, in the post-war amendments. And, um, uh, you know, we moved closer to that position significantly uh, in, in our time. And so what was considered the, you know, the crazy outlying position is pretty mainstream today in terms of- Harlan. Well, what do you think is, is the greatest legacy of, of, of Harlan's uh constitutional thought today but where, where is it where is it going to manifest itself most uh, in the years to come well i think that you know the, his greatest contribution is is his his reference to the foundational principles of american law and his insistence that people follow uh, the notion of equality and equal protection i mean that he is the father of equal protection he's the believer in the equal protection clause and uh, many people see that it is a very problematic time in supreme court history you know he was the person who was uh, supporting the Constitution and and had a much firmer sense of uh, you know what what a constitutional system uh, would would yield and should yield in that uh, in that era than his colleagues did. And do you have any sense of how many sole dissents he wrote compared to other justices? It's hard to know because um, uh, he wrote so many. I guess I, I don't know if there's been an accounting of how many of them were not yeah. were not held. You know, interestingly, some people say some people ask questions and say, "Well, why didn't he stick with the majority and try to you know work within the system to get a better result?" And the reality is that in many of these solo dissents, his position was so much at odds with his colleagues. You know, it was considered just a fundamentally different different position. Uh, and then the irony, of course, is that today we view Harlan's position as the mainstream and the, the court parties as the outlier. Thank you. I think uh, we're at time. We're at time, but I want to look, I, I didn't have a chance to say what an honor it is to be, uh, to be here with all of you uh, and to also uh, be with uh, Judge Wolski, who's such a model of uh, public servant and uh, uh, such an impressive person and a great friend.
and also Josh Blackman, who has done a lot to preserve uh, Harlan's memory and to extend his legacy into the current day. And who's uh, fine. Thank you. Who's and I want to thank the you article also Josh, played a role uh, in the book too. Thank you. Thank, thank both of you guys for making this a very good program. Uh, it's it's a, it's a really great book. I urge everyone check it out. The Great Dissenter. You won't regret it. Thank you. Take care. Yeah, thank you. The link to the book can be found on the webpage for this event, uh, Federalist Fedsoc.org. You can go find the the uh, book link and purchase it there. I just want to extend thanks on behalf of the Federalist Society uh, to you, Peter, Judge Walski, uh, Josh, everyone for participating. The benefit of your valuable time and expertise on this uh, really interesting topic this afternoon. So thank you very much. Thank you also to our audience for tuning in for your great questions. Sorry to any we didn't get to, but I think we covered them. Be sure to check your email and our website for announcements about upcoming events like this one. And uh, until next time, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone.